Hi and welcome to The Print. My name is Karanjeet Kaur. I'm a journalist and an editor. Let's talk today about the recent debate on social media on how Goa has lost its charm for tourists. Last week, the Tourism Department of Goa did something quintessentially Indian. It decided that the best way to counter negative publicity was to double all the way down. Rajesh Kale, who is Goa's Deputy Director of Tourism, filed a police complaint against Ramanuj Mukherjee. Now, Mukherjee is an ex-user who had cited publicly available data to point out that foreign tourists were abandoning Goa for places like Sri Lanka. But what was his crime? According to the complaint, he had caused significant annoyance by sharing data which stated that foreign tourist arrivals fell from 8.5 million in 2019 to 1.5 million in 2023. Now, by any stretch of imagination, these figures are absolutely wild. According to several reports, in the pre-pandemic years between 2014 and 19, Goa received around 0.8 million foreign tourists each year. But that clarification did not come from the state's tourism department that busied itself with offing the messenger's head. This is what the complaint alleges. Mukherjee referenced China Economic Information Center data in his post. However, the credibility of this data is questionable, as he neither consulted with the Department of Tourism prior to posting, nor validated the data he collected. The statements made by Sri Ramanuj Mukherjee appear to have the intent to cause public unrest and may induce individuals to commit offences against the state or against public tranquility. Now, Mukherjee's post would have sunk without a trace, had it not garnered so much attention. I see versions of this tired debate get ignited every few weeks on X, where domestic tourists complain about feeling unwelcome. They are countered very swiftly by local residents who let them know in no uncertain terms why they are unwelcome. Like a lot of things in Goa, both sides of this tussle are simultaneously right and wrong. It's a perfect illustration of the Rashomon effect, where official statistics and lived experiences tell completely divergent stories. While the tourism department might be technically correct about Mukherjee's numbers being off, the lacks of responses his post triggered suggest that he stumbled onto an uncomfortable truth. When so many tourists share stories about being scammed, overcharged, or generally be disappointed, perhaps the exact numbers matter less than what the chorus is trying to tell us. At least this absurd episode perfectly encapsulates how Goan authorities respond to criticism. With denial, obfuscation, a healthy dose of passing the parcel, and the occasional police complaint. Whether that criticism is about declining tourism or disappearing ecosystems. These tensions between the pro-tourism government, anti-tourism residents, and tourists themselves have reached an inflection point several times in the last few years. After the pandemic, city folks armed with work-from-home policies and deep pockets have bought up land and houses across the state, pricing locals out of their own neighbourhoods. The disruption to local life is impossible to ignore. For instance, residents in Anjuna and Bhagatar recently staged a silent protest against ear-splitting EDM parties. Meanwhile, in Sankwale, former Sarpanch Premanand Nayak went on a protest fast against a mega-infrastructure project by Bhutani Infra. These are valid concerns that the government can't keep papering over. Sooner or later, they'll have to address the growing discomfort that tourists and a floating migrant population bring to Goa's residents. But here's the darker irony. While we are busy arguing about who gets to enjoy Goa, the state itself seems to be vanishing piece by piece. There is a battleground on every front you look at, whether it's Goa's hills, forests, or even its beaches. The state's wetlands, mangroves, and khazan lands, which are ancient ecosystems that have protected the coast for centuries, are all under attack. And when the fight is between our last lines of defense against climate change and a dead-eyed corporation promising sea view second homes to jaded city folk, we all know which way the scales will tip. As usual, the only form of meaningful resistance comes from civil society. A couple of weeks ago, while authorities were presumably busy 
scanning social media for complaints against Goa, a small festival attempted to shine a light on one of these endangered guardians. The Mangrove Odyssey brought together artists, musicians, chefs and environmentalists to celebrate and understand Goa's mangrove ecosystems. These complex networks protect our beaches from erosion, shield our coasts from flooding and sustain the very biodiversity that makes Goa so sought after. The festival was organised by One Earth Foundation, a year-old organisation in the marine space that focuses on education, building nature-based resilience and a circular economy. The foundation is an NGO that also turns plastic waste collected from beach and mangrove cleanups into furniture. And it is supported by Make My Trip and Pirocha Godrich Foundation. Over a month, One Earth Foundation organized workshops, walking trails, lectures, and photography and painting competitions themed around mangroves. It all kicked off with a pre-event called Mangrove Musicana, where musicians played gentle odes to the mangroves with local instruments. Chef Michael Swamy demonstrated lost recipes from the mangrove, including one made with the highly coveted mangrove salt, which is gathered from the leaves of the shrubs. The festival also featured an installation by Miriam Koshi Sukhija of the mangrove Rakhandar. Now, the Rakhandar is what is loosely translated as the guardian spirit of the forest. The installation was fashioned out of medical gauze. Two years ago, Koshi had also put together a similar moving exhibit at Mercy's, the most prominent of North Goa's dead mangroves, bisected by a newly constructed highway. Despite the slightly depressing nature of the festival, Ferdin Sylvester, who is the director of the foundation, seemed very upbeat with the results. Sylvester, who is pursuing a PhD, is mapping Goa's mangroves through drones and remote sensing technology. He told me, Officially, Goa's mangrove cover has grown by 2%, but I am trying to see how much of that is true. He is referring to the acres of dying mangroves near Ponda, Nerul, and along the Divar Chorao island belt. Still, Sylvester hopes that festivals like Mangrove Odyssey will spark some curiosity among the attendees. The threat to mangroves isn't just a Goan problem. It's a global crisis unfolding in slow motion. In May, the International Union for Conservation of Nature announced that 50% of the world's mangrove ecosystems are at risk of collapse. Air pollution from the Indo-Gangetic Plain is choking the Sundarbans, the world's largest mangrove forest. The Sundarbans, as we know, protect millions of people living in the Delta region and sequester more carbon than even the Amazon rainforest. The same story repeats everywhere from Florida to Sri Lanka, the very destination that's supposedly stealing Goa's tourists. These realities found their way into a haunting photography exhibition called Breath of Mangroves by Harshay Jha and Pranay Chandok. The photographers, as part of a residency organized by Atelier Monad, spent two months documenting these ecosystems, though most of their time was washed out by rains. The result is 20 desaturated images shot on film that capture the duality of Goa's mangroves. The metaphor repeated throughout their research. In Mercy's, Jha and Chando found water lilies flourishing where mangroves once stood, a deceptively pretty sign of an ecosystem in distress. The exhibition tells a story of the constant struggle between nature and humanity, where even attempts at preservation sometimes hasten destruction. Perhaps this is why the tourism department's response to criticism feels particularly tone deaf. While they're busy filing police complaints about damaged reputations and public tranquility, Goa's actual reputation, its mangroves, its khazans, its entire ecological heritage, is being bulldozed into oblivion. The real damage to Goa's reputation isn't coming from social media posts. It's coming from those who claim to be protecting it.